Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Sanjay Torre, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio. And Sanjay, the first thing I always have to know is what you did this weekend. Those are the what rules. What did I do this weekend? Nothing. I think your weekend was a little bit more exciting than It mine. was. I got to go to Food That Rocks. I, I thought of that. Yeah. I'm like, I know Lee and Stone have and to be at that. I was watching the weather like a farmer to make sure oh. that it broke just in time. And Saturday night it did break and it was yeah. fine. And we walked over there with some neighbors. It was a lot of fun. There was 28 restaurants, wow. a band. Was it, was it good? It was good stuff. That's awesome. Food the Rocks. Thank you, Sky Estroff with the Taste of Atlanta crew. Uh, we're always happy to support them and their work, and that is a great event. Well, I wish I could have been there. <laughs> well, that was great, but not as great as what we're going to do in here. No. This is where the magic happens. Exactly. All right. We got three great guests, and we're going to learn about them right now. First up on Atlanta Business Radio, we got Catherine Chestnut with Alkaloid Networks. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, Catherine, you're not only with Alkaloid, you got a, is this a side hustle or how, how is this uh, related to your work at Alkaloid, the co-working, Atlanta co-working club? Well, Alkaloid Networks is my, is, is my main hustle. That's your main hustle. Definitely. <laughs> and then, okay, so let's start there. What are you doing with Alkaloid? Um, I founded Alkaloid just over four years ago. Um, it's right on the belt line. Started with 4,000 square feet. And quickly grew to 14,000 square feet within two years. And then what happens at Alkaloid? Uh, it's a co-working space. Um, initially started uh, with simply private offices and dedicated desks, but uh, a couple years ago expanded to some um, shared space as well. Um, and the membership is incredibly diverse. And then what, what had you been doing prior that you said, you know what, I think I'm going to start a co-working uh, <laughs> endeavor here. Well, this was about a million mm -hmm. miles away. <laughs> At least initial, my initial thought was it was a million miles away from where I started. Um, I spent 30 years doing uh, marketing, the last 10 of which was heavily focused on marketing strategy for face-to-face mm -hmm. -face environments. Uh -huh. And I decided I got a tired of traveling all the time because I was doing that. Were you working for an agency or an enterprise level company? I, I, all of the above. I worked for small businesses, medium enterprise level, um, on the client side. And the last 10 I spent working for a face-to-face -face agency. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I left and decided to spend more time helping my family, taking care of my daughter and of course, being somebody who's used to doing something all the time, decided very cavalierly to open Alkaloid and and it just grew from there. So now was Alkaloid open at the beginning of like where was the belt line in its development when you started? The pavement had just been finished on the east side. By, is that the Krog Street side? Yes, we are a stone's throw from Krog Street. So that's where Icebox and... Yep. I walk past Icebox every day. And I live four blocks from the, from uh, the office. So you walk there I or do. you bike or scooter? I, I don't scooter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have ridden my bike there, but it feels a little silly because by the time I Get pedal, all, I'm there. Okay, right. So now um, that must have been an exciting time when that belt line came. Were you around when they were debating the merits of it? Yes. So yes. you were part of that group that helped. Make it happen? Yes. I live in Inman Park, so I was very much a part of watching that grow. It was it was wonderful. And I'm also a part of the Seed and Feed Marching Abominable band out of Little Five Points. And so there's a music, a music side of you as well? well? Yes. There's, <laughs> I seem to do everything. <laughs> so now when you said, okay, we're going to put a co-working space here because... Um, that, that that would be a good addition to the community, mm -hmm. right? It would be a kind of a place where people can hang out and do work and then get to know each other. Is that what, like, what was your intention? My original intention was I needed office space. For yourself? For myself. <laughs> and I found this really cool historic uh, cotton mill mm -hmm. and uh, it was 4,000 square feet, which was way more than what I needed. So... Very cavalierly, I said, oh, I'll just rent out the extra space and <laughs> and 
cover my costs and have a really cool place to work. So I built it in mind with everything that I wanted. Right. And apparently other people <laughs> wanted that too. So now initially, so was the minimum viable product like your office for you and your stuff? And then like a bunch of desks and chairs and a coffee machine? Was that kind of the, the beginning of this? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. A couple conference uh-huh. rooms. I mean, there were some things that I knew needed to be included. Right. Um, to make it valuable to other people. Right. But yes, that's kind of how it started. And then was it a membership thing or were you charging by the hour? What was the initial kind of model? Um, it was a membership. So it was always a membership mm-hmm. in your mind. And you had seen other co-working spaces around the world or, or uh, were a little familiar? Just, just a teeny tiny bit. <laughs> but um, once it kind of took off, which I was full within two months, that was when <laughs> I was like, whoa. This People is a, are hungry for this. This is a thing. Right. Um, and so I immediately put on my marketing hat <laughs> and did all my research and became involved in the global co-working community and learned as much as I could to make sure that I was following best practices. So now when it became more than just, oh, this was a fun little side thing. And now it's like, oh, my, I got a responsibility now, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> There's a lot of members. And that is kind of a different mentality than a lot of business. They don't look at their, their clients as members, right? Mm-hmm. So how did that mental shift, like what were you doing to really serve those members now? I think from the beginning, just because it's my nature, um, I was very, very Uh, what do I want to say, interested uh, in what my members were doing and helping them to succeed in whatever way that I could. Um, There were, there have been members who were going to -to face-to-face events, trade shows, mobile uh, marketing, things Mm -hmm. like that, who had no idea how to do that because they were small businesses. And so I have taught marketing classes at Alkaloid. Mm -hmm. I have helped people build their Um, event strategy when they're going to events. Um, So So you got to put on kind of your marketing hat to help kind of do marketing or at least educate them about marketing that maybe they weren't aware of. And that was like a value add that I'm sure a lot of other co-working spaces don't, that doesn't come along for the ride, right? In most other places. Well, I'm I'm (laughs) sure that that's true, but there is a lot of smart people out there. But I think more in... More importantly, I cared about what was going on for my people and and have made some friends along the way. And um, I feel very grateful that I'm there to be able to help people when they need it, whether it be through business marketing initiatives or if somebody is sick and they or their parents are ill and they have to be gone for a couple months. I'm just like, I got you. Don't worry. I'll take care of your stuff. You just go take care of your family. So um, you really get to know this personal relationship. It's not like a spreadsheet with members. <laughs> that, that, correct. That, that some of these big box um, co-working spaces offer. Yours is more personal and you're really kind of serving the community as a true community. Absolutely. Not just office space. Absolutely. Not flexible office space. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I would say that the, the larger or the larger big box co-working spaces serve a purpose. We right. all have a different vibe. We all have a different need that we serve. So I feel like we all are providing a service that somebody is going to need. So now in your space, um, is there a profile of a member? Or are they, you know, doing creative things? Are they makers? Like uh, you know, the there gamut? Is everything under the sun at Alkaloid. Um, there are... There's startups, there's tech startups, there's web developers, there's CPAs and attorneys, there's a chiropractor who has magical hands. Um, There's just everything under the sun there. Well, uh, some of these large enterprise um, co-working spaces are going after kind of regional offices of large firms. Is that kind of in your profile as well, or is your more the small to mid-sized business owner? Um, I would say that about 50% of our members are remote workers for Mm -hmm. a larger organization, whether they have a dedicated desk that it's just them at Alkaloid or they have uh, or it's a small office for a company that is headquartered elsewhere. In fact, there's one company that has their headquarters in Alpharetta, but all their downtown people don't want to go to Alpharetta. Right. So 
they have a small office at Alkaloid to accommodate those people. And uh, so far, what's been the most rewarding part of kind of this venture? Has it, has it put your marketing kind of consulting on the side and now you're focused all on Alkaloid? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a real thing. Like I have, I had uh, clients who kept begging me, please come and help me. And I'm like, dude, I'm seriously, I, I, this, is, here. this is my business now. This is what I do. Right. So yes. And I would say the most rewarding thing is, is just getting to know different people every day. Mm-hmm. And at different stages in their business kind of mm-hmm. life. Now, um, what are some of the benefits that maybe a person's working out of the house and they think, I don't need to, to be part of a co-working space because I, you know, I have internet, I have coffee, you know, I can have my dog. Like, like what, what are kind of some of the pros and cons of moving and growing into a co-working space? It's interesting. I was talking to a friend on my way here this morning and she has a small business and works out of her home. And... She was going on. She goes, oh, so-and-so just showed up at my house at 3 o'clock yesterday and thought that I would be able to, like, take the day off or said, oh, let's have a vacation day on Thursday and go do something fun. And she's saying, well, um, no, I got work to do. I have a business to run. She says, Catherine, everybody thinks that just because I work from home, I'm partying hard all the time. And I'm like, no, it's not true. Um, so frequently what I hear is people saying there's distractions at home, um, people that have their kids out for the summer or even just, you know, the dog or they need human interaction, interaction. right? The cat is not the replacement for a human, right? so to speak. Well, I'll tell you one of the biggest benefits I think in co-working space, uh, is the collisions, these kind of serendipitous quote unquote collisions where you run into somebody doing something and you're like, what are you doing? And, and these little mashups can occur because, you know, small to mid-sized business is hard and there's a high failure rate for a lot of them. And you have a built in kind of network that, Hey, if my thing does go South, there might be a place to jump onto, you know, in the cubicle next to me or in the, in the couch next to me. It's- Do you find that? I love when that happens. I especially love it when it happens and I wasn't the connector. (laughs) Uh, Or it happened by itself. When it happened just between the members. But I'll have somebody say, oh, do you know somebody who does so-and-so? As a matter of fact, that person Uh, sits right over there. And it's great. But I, like I said, I especially love it when it happens when I wasn't the connector because I want the members to to get to know so each organically other. organically kind of. Right. So when, what things do you do to kind of encourage that kind of organic uh, getting to know each other? So there's usually one or two uh, community events every month. Um, we are having a blood drive on Friday. Uh, Life South is coming out with their mobile bus. Um, we usually have a barbecue grill out kind of thing. Um, if it's nice out, which hopefully it won't be raining the following week. Um, we have movie nights. Um, we also have meetups. Some of our members host meetups. That's part of the benefits of their membership. They get access to this, to the space for events for no additional cost. Wow. So, um, and everybody gets invited to the meetup in the space. So if they're interested, they're, they use, usually tend to be more on the tech <laughs> tech side, but right. that's totally fine. So there's usually something going on. So now uh, walk me through the different membership levels. Is there, how's it work? Um, so the lowest level of membership is what I call a community membership. And it's uh, in, a lot of people use that just to receive mail and packages and things like that. But it includes three days a month of shared desk space. Um, and when you're there, you have access to all of the amenities, which includes unlimited conference room usage. Um, the next level is a flex desk membership, which is 10 days a month. So I had some people that came about because I had some people who traveled for work who didn't want to pay for a dedicated desk because they traveled so much, but they also they also wanted a place to go when they weren't on the road right. that wasn't home so they wouldn't be distracted by the dog and the kids and everything else. Um, and then the next level is dedicated desk. And then I have private offices that range from 100 square feet up to um, 400 square feet. And uh, now as you 
I've been doing this for a minute or two. How is it evolving the way you anticipated? I had no idea what to expect, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I, I feel, um, I feel happy where I'm at right now. I've considered opening a second location. I've been approached by other people to do that. I'm looking at possibly doing that now. Um, but I think that the Atlanta Coworking Alliance was kind of a natural next step for me to to bring more of the owner operators independence in the city together and create something bigger than just ourselves. So now let's talk about that a little bit. Now, what is the uh, Atlanta Coworking Alliance? Uh, the Atlanta Coworking Alliance is a group of independent um, co-working spaces within the metro area, um, and it is designed to create a place for uh, the people of Atlanta to be able to go and find what they're looking for, whether they're looking for a maker space, they're looking for a photo studio, or they're looking for a small private office, they and they can go and find that without having to Google and search, you know, the 30 some odd co-working spaces. And those are just the independent spaces. Right. Um, within the city of Atlanta. So it's designed to help people find what they're looking for in addition to the people, the spaces that are a part of the alliance, um, helping their members become more aware of what's available and and create value for if you are if your space is a part of the alliance and you need to use something at another space you can get a discount doing that. And we're still working that out because we're pretty fresh and new and green, but this is kind of, the idea is to bring more value to the citizens of Atlanta and give them options. Right. And, and the allow the independents to kind of offer some of these other kind of perks that the larger enterprise ones have just because they have multiple locations. Absolutely. Now, um, are there other co-working alliances or is this unique to Atlanta? Oh gosh, no. I was, uh, I've been going to the Juicy Conference for a number of years, which is the Global Coworking Unconference Conference, <laughs> um, and have met uh, the people that founded the Kansas City Alliance, as well as the San Diego Alliance. And they really inspired me to just go for it and do this because I felt like we, we needed this in the city. I mean, of a city this size, a world-class city, right. we need an alliance and we need to help each other. How many independent co-working spaces are there? You said around 30? There's more than 30. Um, I would say there's closer, closer on the 40, but for right now. Um, and does that include like the um, incubators and, and things like that? Or is this strictly independent co-working spaces? Um, so one of the requirements for being a part of the alliance is that the founder is um, actively involved in the space. So I don't care if you have three or four spaces as part of your your business, as long as you are actively involved in the co working space business itself, then you're eligible. You are you are right there. Yes. And then do you all get together? Is there a co-working kind of meetup? Yes. Um, well, actually, we're going to have our first one in about a week. So, And then when we're there, um, we'll be um, planning for International slash Atlanta Coworking Day. So um, I've already got that being done by the mayor. We will be proclaiming Friday, um, August 9th as Atlanta co-working day. Wow. And then uh, that's the day of this big meetup or no, uh, we're meeting, in, we're meeting in June so that we can plan what we're going to be offering. We're, I feel like we're a little behind on this, but that's okay. <laughs> Cause we're just, like I said, fresh and green right out of the box. So now what do you need more of? How can we help you? Oh my goodness. I need more. I need more spaces to sign up and to be a part of this alliance. Um, the website is live. It's mm -hmm. atlantacoworking.club. And we need more spaces to be a part of this so that we can really add value um, for our members. And then the spaces that are involved, um, are they 
have you not identified them or is it you just need them to kind of reach out? Um, I have identified them. So we know where they are. Yes. <laughs> we At just least gotta there's persuade them to yes, be part of this. Absolutely. All right. We will make that happen. And then how about the websites for both Alkaloid and the uh, Alliance again? Uh, Alkaloid.net is A-L-K-A-L-O-I-D dot net is for the co-working space. And that co-working space is on the belt line. So if you are a small business person located around it, there's no excuses. You should be a member. It's so awesome there. <laughs> right. The belt line is fabulous. Right. And then uh, for the Alliance, that's for any co-worker, uh, independent co-working person around town. Yes, absolutely. I would say um, the more... Uh, spaces that sign up, the more value that we're going to provide. Right, everybody the, wins right, as the network right. grows. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for having me. Hang with us. We've got a couple more guests. All righty. All right. Next up on Atlanta Business Radio, Lisa Lade Davis, Kennesaw CPA. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. So what you learn in the last segment? Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. I love the, the concept. We work with a lot of small businesses, and we know one of the challenges they have is not having the team of people around them to take care of all the different hats that they have to wear. So I love the idea of people networking, uh, using the resources there, and connecting with one another. So now, um, as a kid, you were like, one day I'm going to be a CPA. That was a dream of dreams. <laughs> I think I had many uh, career options, but I did settle on this early on. Uh, one of my first jobs was actually working for a CPA. My second job was working for a CPA. <laughs> so it was kind of in the cards. So you're good at math? Like what drew you to accounting? Uh, I love numbers. I always love to to play with numbers. And, you know, it's just something that I did that I enjoyed. I enjoyed business. And so those two went hand in hand. And then uh, what was, did you, out of college, did you go, okay, I'm going to work for a CPA firm or I'm going to st start my own thing? What was kind of the, the path? I knew once I started and, and got on that route, I wanted to become a certified public accountant. So um, when I started with, with my school, um, at the time, I just wanted to, I think it was big five or big six at the time. Who knows what the they number keep shrinking. is now. It'll yeah, be a big shrinking. one at some point. <laughs> so yeah, at the time, that was my goal. I wanted to go. I wanted to do that for 10 plus years and then eventually go into my own business. So did you end up in one of those firms? No, I never went a totally made... different route. <laughs> <laughs> so then what happened? You got into a, a more mid-sized firm or a smaller firm? I actually started off um, on the analysis side because actually that was where I enjoyed working with the mm -hmm. numbers is the analytical piece. So I started off as a financial analyst, uh, but I still knew I wanted to get my CPA license. So I quickly transitioned into that and spent a number of years doing government audits, which was not so much fun. That's glamorous. The glamorous <laughs> that was, accounting yeah, that was enough to run me out of it. Uh, and doing, you know, some corporate tax and things like that. So um, I did eventually make it into that with some of the smaller CPA firms, which was a great experience because then I got to do a lot more within the scope of my industry versus working in one particular segment with a large firm. So now how did you make the transition into serving that, you know, small business person? Because that's a, this is a totally different animal now. It, it really is. And uh, what somewhere along the way I had a detour and um, I actually ran an insurance agency for 10 plus years. So in working with insurance, I worked with a lot of nonprofits as well as a lot of small businesses. Right. And uh, one of the things that I, was kind of attracted to was just the struggles that the small business owners had just trying to do everything. They were IT, they were marketing, they were operations, they were figuring out their insurance, their finance and accounting. And so with the firm I was working with, we were always putting in solutions for small businesses. Actually, we got recognized one year as the, uh, from SBA as the champion for small businesses. And that's what I wanted to continue on with my firm is to continue to champion small businesses and provide resources for them. And because you see that's a real gap, right? Because they're out there battling. And, you know, just because you're a good mechanic and you're good at mechanicking, there's a running a business is a different thing than mechanicking. Yes, we say that all the time. People start a business because either, you know, it's one of a couple things. Either they have a passion for something that they do and they love it and they think they're going to go for the rest of their life and do this one thing or they want to become their own boss. Um, either one, they get into it and they figure out that they spend a lot of time not doing the one the thing part that they, they wanted to do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so what we do is we encourage people is to quickly find that network 
of the, you know, that community, that network of people, outsource what you can, bring in the resources, and do that to try to alleviate some of those early year pains that you're going to have um, as a small business. As so, you mentioned before, a lot of small businesses fail in the first few years, and there's a lot of reasons why. Some of the top reasons are really related to their finance and accounting. So now, how does it work? Like I find you, uh, most people I would imagine have a CPA or some bookkeeping right now, so they're switching to you, you I would think, you know, a lot of the we, time. We, sometimes we start up with the startup companies. I actually work with a couple of groups. Um, there is a startup group that I work with, um, as well as a group called the Edge Connection. They are a women's uh, women's own business center that's funded by SBA. And so they are starting with a lot of people because a lot of people, when they start their small businesses, they may have an accountant that they're using for tax season, mm -hmm. but they're not engaging that accountant all year long. And when you start a small business, it's a different animal. You, you're doing planning from day one. And that's when you need to engage that accountant. That's when you need to engage that planner. So sometimes it's just you know, making people aware of that. Uh, a lot of small businesses, they won't call their accountant because, you know, they don't want to get the, the few hundred dollar bill or not know what the bill is. And so that's why one of the things, one of the first things we put in place was a program called the Tax Guide. And it's just the taxguide.com. Uh, people can go online and they sign up, but it's a subscription based program. So for a low monthly fee, they get access to these consultations all year long. And so they can be web consultations, phone consultations, but it's allowing them to get those answers um, to their questions answered all year long and not wait till the end of the year and not wait till, you know, there's time to do their taxes when there's some things that still can be done, but not as much as if they engage their accountant. Right, because at that point you're reactive rather than proactive. And Absolutely. you can, if you just kind of manage this every quarter or every six months, or, you can kind of alleviate a lot of these problems. Yeah, or incorporate it in your decision making. Right. Um, a lot of the struggles I see small businesses have is they start with their business plan and they, you know, their business plan incorporates their projections or financial scenario, but it's one scenario. And the options that might happen once they get started is the multitude. So if they're not adequately capitalized or financed, they start to struggle maybe in that six-month period or that one-year period. And it's just be able to look at all those different financial scenarios and say, do I have a solution if the industry changes? Do I have a solution um, if my cost increases or my revenue doesn't start when, it, when it's, you know, it's planned to? So it's working with someone to get that done. Now, for you, um, what's the typical relationship you have? Is it something that if I sign up and we switch Business Radio X moves to your CPA firm from our existing mm -hmm. one, is that something I'm going to see you once a year? Or do you schedule quarterly? Is there a monthly call? Like, how does the relationship look like? You know, it varies with clients. Some of my clients um, we're more have to be more hands-on, so it is a monthly engagement where we're looking at, you know, we link up first by the software. So we either sign them up, either it's FreshBooks, Zero, or QuickBooks. But we're both looking at the same financial data each month. So each month we're looking at something on that client. And then if we have questions or if we need to engage, that call happens each month. But at a minimum, we're meeting with each person quarterly to say, okay, this is where we started with your company. This were the projections that you put in place, and this is how you're currently operating. These are some of the steps that we need to take. These are the implications to your taxes, things like that. And then if the client doesn't want to meet quarterly, does that mean they're just not a good fit for you? Well, we still, we still work with them, but um, we're always reaching out. So even as long as we're having access to the data, we can look at the information and we can tell them what their expectations are. Now, if they want to wait to the end of the year to handle some of those things or not take the recommendations, that's totally up to them and right. how they decide to run their business. Now, one of the challenges in the small business that we talked about is this kind of lack of a network and, and know who the trusted advisors are. Do you help in that regard? Like if I need a lawyer or I need an insurance person, do you, can you help connect me with some of these people that I might, that you might see that I need because you're looking at all the numbers? Yes, there are, because we're just engaged with business every day and we work with different groups like the Edge Connection or the Business Startup, there's a lot of resources we have at our hands that we can point people. So there are a few attorneys that if someone's looking for something specific that I can recommend um, – there, I, you know, for a lot of my clients, I recommend a separate financial advisor. So while I can give them financial advice, I'm not going to sell them products. 
So if they need to... So you're staying in your lane. I stay in my lane. <laughs> right. But if I see that as a small business owner, they'll benefit from a solo 401k, I'm going to point them to that right you know, financial right. advisor to get that set up and put in because not only would it benefit their taxes, it's, it's going to benefit their long-term financial plan. And then so that's part of your uh, business is to kind of vet these and find out who the good guys are. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Right, because that's part of what I'm paying for with it's, you, right? I'm, well, I'm you're kind of the quarterback of my uh, <laughs> finances. I mean, it is difficult because you want to work with people that are going to recommend solutions that are in the best interest of your client, and not just from a, you know, we're marketing this product this month kind right. of thing. And because in the end, it, it is going to affect my relationship with the client and the client's end product as far as their their taxes, their planning, their sort of thing. So. Yes. Now, do you have any uh, kind of success stories you can share where you work with a client and help them go to a next level? You know, we see success stories just every day. We start with clients that are so frustrated. They're they're coming to us and they want to talk about, okay, how do I shut this business down? And Mm -hmm. taking it from there to, okay, I'm looking at this through new lens now and I'm ready to try this again and I'm ready to start this up with the right team, Mm -hmm. the right resources, and I know where to go to get some financing and what I need and I'm ready to start this. Every day when we see that sort of thing, that's our success story. Now, do you help with if somebody wants to get like an SBA loan or something like that? And because there's a lot of paperwork in any of those kind of financing. You know, we point them in the right direction. We can help them with the financial aspect of that. So if they have to put together their financial statements or some uh, projections, right? Because a lot of small business that you know they have one set of books. You know, they're all intermingled. They're personal and their business. But if you want a loan like that, you got to really keep things separate. That's the first thing we we tell them. If someone comes in with a, a business that they just start up it uh, for one let's look at your legal structure see how your business is structured um, what's the you know because there's a difference between the legal structure and the tax structure and so we look at that and then we look are you t- are you taking all the steps to keep your business assets separate from your personal because the the point not the well the key point in actually when you incorporate and you structure your business is to protect yourself personally is to keep business liabilities separate from your personal that goes away when you start to commingle the funds. Mm -hmm. So our first recommendation is make sure you have that separate account for business and you're treating business separate than personal. And then another mistake we hear in here a lot is that on one hand, they're trying to show that they didn't make any money, right? To avoid taxes. And then they want to get a loan, and then the, you know, the financiers like, well, you don't have any money, and it's like, well, I do. It's just, you know, I'm not showing it over. It's like you can't have it both ways, right? You, I'm sure you're you know, counseling people around that. We do, and that that's probably the client that that we may not, <laughs> you know, work with sometimes, <laughs> because you know we get that question. It's like, well, I want to pay the least amount of tax as possible, which we all do, but we want to do it legally. Right. But I need to buy a home next year. It's like those two don't yeah, those right. two don't necessarily coincide. But what you do is you do have to report your income as earned and report all eligible expenses that you can, you know, put in on your tax return and support and, you know, and pay the tax situation that goes along with that. And there's different things we can put in place to reduce those taxes, but it's not going to be eliminating income. But that's an example of where by having a regular conversation and knowing what their goals are, you can get ahead of things instead yes. of the month before they're trying to get a house loan. And then you're like, OK, fix all this stuff that I did for five years. You know, and that's the thing I think that surprised people the most because they want to come to me and say, OK, what what business structure should I should I use? I says, well, I need to see what you did the last three years. I need to know what you're doing this year, and I need to know what you're going to do the next three years. Mm -hmm. That's going to tell us what business structure you should use for your company as far as tax-wise. So planning is always important. Now, uh, you're called Kennesaw CPA. Does all your work happen in Kennesaw, or you have clients all over the place? No, my Mm -hmm. my office is in Kennesaw, uh, but my clients are all over the metro area. Um, I think we started with Kennesaw CPA because we wanted to associate it associate that brand with something local, someone present and someone that's going to be there. Mm-hmm. And then, so when you work with your clients, do they have to drive up to Kennesaw or you handle most of your stuff over the phone or how's it work? You know, we do a, a combination. It depends what the client's most uh, comfortable with. Sometimes I go to the client's site. If it's going to be a long meeting, uh, say an hour or more, we might do it at the client site if we need access to some of the information there. We do web meetings, we do phone calls, and we do in-person meetings at our office. So it's it's a variety. 
Good stuff. So if somebody wanted to learn more, have more some sort of conversation, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You know, they can email me at lisa.davis at kennesawcpa.com. They can check out our website at kennesawcpa.com. Or if they want to know more about the tax guide, they can actually go to www.dtaxguide.com. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. All right. Thanks. Hang with us. Got one more guest, and it's a, a young entrepreneur that's making things happen. You ready, uh, Nikita? Yes. How are you doing? Dave? All right. Welcome. Cute and cocky, Nikita Gordon, CEO and founder. Yes. It's nice to be on here today. All right. Lean in there. You got to rock okay. star that mic. <laughs> so tell yes. us about Cute and Cocky. Uh, Cute and Cocky is a business that I started while I was in college. Um, um, it's basically a firearm retention accessory and apparel company. And I started it two years ago. Um when uh, I experienced an event where I had a customer that decided he wanted to follow me home from work, and me being a young female, I figured I may need to have something, you know, to protect myself, some type mm-hmm. of self-defense item. And I thought to myself, how do other women carry? And you know, usually, so how do they carry? They usually carry <laughs> uh, purse holsters or um, some type of pepper spray on their keychain. Right. But those things can be kind of counteractive to trying to defend yourself in a moment's notice. Right. So I figured I need something on me at all times, like on me. And that's when I decided to manufacture my own uh, firearm retention system that is sold into my business blazer. Uh huh. And so now I could carry a small compact or compact handgun. And then you just, it's actually sewn into the yes. jacket? Yes. So now, um, so if I buy this, then I have to sew it in myself? Yes. So well, I would recommend that you get a seamstress or a tailor. <laughs> <laughs> and they're able to do it? Yes. And is this patented or is this? It is patented. Wow, good for you. Thank you. Now, what was it like going through the patent process? That's a, that's a job by itself. Um, it most definitely was. Um, I decided to do my provisional patent on my own. You just did it. You just figured it out. Yeah, I did a lot of research <laughs> and figured it out. <laughs> wow. Um, and then it's a company in Atlanta called Georgia Lawyers of Art, and they uh, pair up patent attorneys with inventors or um, artists that want to like copyright their work. And I was able to get with a patent attorney in Philadelphia. And they were able to do my non-provisional patent pro bono. Wow, good for you. Now, you. taking an idea like this, when you have the idea to actually patenting it and then getting it out to the market, did you have mentors? Like, how did you, or you just figured all this out on your own? Uh, I most definitely had mentors. Mm-hmm. Uh, to begin, I had mentors from the university. Um, Which university? The University of West Georgia. Uh Um, And I have my professors in business. I also have a small business development center on campus at West Georgia. So I have a business consultant there. And they were able to help you? Yes. So were you surprised there was that many resources at your disposal? I figured it was a college (laughs) campus, so they were there. (laughs) But to the extent that they were able to help me, I was very surprised. So now you go in there with this idea, and were they all like, yeah, great idea, go for it? Or what was it like at the beginning? Um, Well, they most definitely was uh, interested in helping me, but I have no prior experience in the firearms industry. So they told me I need to begin with research and, you know, knowing my customer base and knowing exactly, you know, what type of situation I'm getting myself into before. So now the perfect target market is a woman yes. that already carries a weapon or is the uh, first time weapon carrier? I would say women um, that are gun owners. Um, and statistically, there are a lot of women that are becoming gun owners. So those are primarily my target market. So now how do you find them? I go to the gun range. <laughs> <laughs> you, so you hang out at gun ranges, um, look for the women. And yes. then, hey, look what I have. The, you show them the Something holster. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually worked with a local gun range shot spot in Carrollton, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And um, the gun range owner, he allows me to work with his concealed carry classes for women and work with his firearm instructors um, who are also women. So this allowed me access to my target market immediately where I'm at. So now, um, in order to scale the business, how are you going to get in front of all the, the gun ranges around the country? Well, so far, um, 
I have recently attended the 2019 SHOT Show in Las Vegas. This is where most of uh, a lot of the firearm dealers um, are and the ranges owners. So they are able to see my product, which they were. They're very interested. And I was also able to meet my competitors to know, you know, how am I different? How do they like the product that I'm bringing to the market? And this was able to get me in front of a lot of those individuals. So was it successful? Did you get some orders? It was very successful. I got my first orders. Uh-huh. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of times those events are very lucrative because you get to meet a lot of people in one time. Yeah. Now, what'd you learn from going through that experience? Did you have a table with your stuff there? Um, How, what no, was it like? I did like a um, a mentorship with the gun range owner in Carrollton. He was able to walk me through so that I could be properly introduced to the different dealers. Um, and so he was there. He was there, and so you got to be in his booth. Uh, he didn't have a booth. He actually was walking around. Oh, um, just walking around with you? Yeah, and introducing <laughs> you to people. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> Well, you seem to do a great job attracting people to help. That's yeah. that's hard to do. So now when you went there, were you nervous? I was very nervous. <laughs> um, it was a five-day conference. You know, I was able to meet a lot of individuals. A lot of walking, huh? Lots it's of a big, walking. Las Vegas is a big place. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> So now, what was it like when you opened up, when they opened the doors and you walk in and you see all those booths and it's like crazy? It was amazing. You know, it gave me a vision of where I wanted to be in the next <laughs> couple of years with my company. So so now you walk around, you have these conversations. Uh, what were some of the questions they were asking you about the product? Um, basically, how the product works and how is it different from theirs. And basically, mine is a para attachment and a lot of uh, holsters, uh, individual uh, um, holsters that you could carry, like off body or around your waist. Right, and this is actually sewn into the sewn garment. Into the garment. So now, what's the pros and cons of sewing it into the garment? Um, I would say the pros would be that you will have it on body and immediate access. The cons would probably be. I don't know. You uh, the summertime. The summertime. <laughs> if you don't is- wear that jacket, <laughs> you got to sew it on all your stuff. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I would say that would be kind. Of, it have to be like this is some of your common attire. Right. They wear a lot. Yes. So now, um, what was it like the first sale? Um, my first sale. It was decided. It was during my first um, launching event. And I was able to actually sew his retention system in within you the first sew? couple days. Yes, I learned how to you sew. You learned to, how to sew just for this. Just for this. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so what was it like when you get paid finally for all that work and now it's starting to pay off? Uh, it was a great feeling. You know, I really feel like a business owner. And this is the first business venture I was able to take advantage of. So it was most definitely a great stepping stone for me. Now, do you have any partners uh, in this venture or are you doing this on your own? I am doing this on my own. Wow. So you, you invested all the money and the patent and all the stuff and all the... Yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> so you're going all in. All the chips are on the table. Yes. So what do you need more of? How can we help? Um, I just need more uh, promotion and awareness of my brand and my product and, you know, getting myself out there, especially in the Atlanta area where I'm expanding to. This is one of my um, my next market um, areas that I'm going to be targeting. So just getting the word out there. So now you your the path is typically to go to the gun ranges. So yeah. you want to know every gun range in town, right? Yeah. <laughs> show up and do some something there, right, to let yeah. them know what you're product is i'm also reaching out to the local gun rangers here um now so i'll be coming in during the ladies women's classes the concealed carry classes and my main goal is to have my product stocked in the range so necessarily they'll see my face on my product that's right <laughs> so now if somebody wanted to learn more what's the best way to get a hold of you i would tell them to go to my website at www.ccfirearmapparel.com or email me at cute and at gmail.com good stuff nikita congratulations thank you it's a big achievement thank you <laughs> all right thank you for sharing your story This is Lee Cantor for Sanjay Torre. Thank you to all the guests today. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio.